everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the 10 Lost Tribes. We're gonna be returning to my tracker that I've put together uh, using a spreadsheet. So um, I keep getting comments and stuff shared with me about the 10 Lost Tribes, uh, including this right here. Uh, Janelle sent this to me. And I'm gonna be going, going over this in another video. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that I, I am receiving these things that you guys are sending me. I'll, I'll do it as soon as I can. But uh, I was preparing for another video when I came across something that I just, I had to do a video right now or else I would forget about it. <clears throat> Whereas with your email, I, I'm not going to forget about it. It's in my inbox and I can always come back. So I, I was kind of, I'm, I'm making this video out of necessity. So uh, what happened here is uh, I found a few new entries to put on the tracker. If you're not aware of like my tracker, what I'm doing here, let me zoom in. I have a chronological list of every reference that would have to do with the Ten Lost Tribes. There's two schools of thought within the church. There's a group that believes that the Ten Lost Tribes, um, <clears throat> you know, they were obviously scattered throughout the, the world. We, both camps understand that. But one camp believes that there is a main group that's stuck together, homogenous, and that they're hidden somewhere uh, that we can't find. Whether it, there's a lot of theories about underneath the ice caps, uh, there's theories about caverns, large subterranean caverns, uh, there's theories about a hollow earth, uh, there's theories about them having become become a spacefaring nation, and so they're like colonizing the solar system and maybe beyond, depending on how far their technology advanced. Um, there's other groups that believe that they've been translated. I'd have to say I'd have to agree. I'd have to disagree with that flat out. The reason why is because in uh, Jacob five, in the allegory of the olive tree, the branches that were broken off, which include the ten lost tribes, if they are in a main group, um, all those branches ended up producing bad fruit or wild fruit. So I don't think that that would happen in the case that they were they were translated. <clears throat> there is a reference to them being translated or in some distant location from a, a hymn that <sighs> Eliza Snow, I'll, I'll find it at some point and I'll put it on this spreadsheet. So don't worry, I'm, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of, uh, so that that's the one group. Okay, and then the other group that I belong to, that I subscribe to, is that when we look at the map here, Okay, 721 BC, Assyria came in, conquered the northern kingdom. Some were taken away captive, uh, some not. Some uh, either escaped back down to Judah or they went to other places. And um, essentially what happened is I do believe that there was a main group that went up here, specifically taking this route uh, between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. Uh, the reason why is because there's an Ensign article that covers uh, linguistic changes that happened around 700 BC. Uh, locations, cities, and then also uh, how it seems that there was a group that had an influence on the languages that were up here uh, that were being spoken in Europe. And so my belief is that they primarily, the, the main body, the bulk of them, came up into Europe and that's where they are. And they've become lost to themselves because they became intermixed. They lost their their religion, essentially. Some of them were probably forcibly converted uh, to different religions, as I think was the case in Afghanistan, where there's a group called the Pashtuns that their belief is that they're descended from Israel, but they're Islamic. But they still hold on to um, some Jewish practices and beliefs. And... Um, you know, so when Christ says that he went to go visit the other sheep, you know, in my school of thought, that's not a problem because 700 BC, 700 BC, okay, they're conquered. Some are taken to Assyria. Some escape. So, you know, they go all over the world. Uh, probably pretty early on, they probably remained as groups and communities. You know, 700 years go by. They're still wherever they went, Afghanistan, Georgia, Ukraine. Poland, and then Christ goes and visits them, okay, 700 years after the, the conquest. And then after that, you have new religions that come on the scene, 
you know, like around 600 AD, where Islam conquers really wide swaths of land. Um, you have uh, Christianity that takes hold in Europe. <clears throat> and, um, you know, and then just general assimilation into whatever land that they live in. Okay, so that's my train of thought. So uh, people put together things like this to like to prove that that's not true. And again, I'm going to go over this some other day. But right now, I want to show a few things that I found. Um, so on my tracker, what I have here are the two main schools of thought. There's a, the people that are with the hidden group theory and those that, like me, that are they're not a main group theory. And so red indicates that I've found a reference uh, from a general authority um, or scholar that does not agree that they're in a main group. Okay, so that was the case in uh, the talk given by Ruben V. Aliad in uh, the 2019 October General General Conference in a talk called Found Through the Power of the Book of Mormon. I already did a video on that. I have a, a playlist about the 10 Lost Tribes. So if you want to, um, don't think that I've like taken this lightly or that I haven't studied it. Uh, believe me, I have. Let me find that playlist really quick because before you send me a bunch of stuff, you might want to see what I've already come across. Lost, there we go, 10 Lost Tribes. 10 Lost Tribes, okay. It's probably one of my larger playlists actually. So, um, I'm aware of things like what James E. Talmadge said. I'm aware of what Joseph Fielding Smith said. Okay. The way that I look at it is this. <clears throat> Let's go to the scriptures. Let's read Isaiah uh, chapter 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And then a little bit later on in verse 13, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So the way that the, you know, the way that the word the Lord works, here it is in, in DNC, DNC 98:12. For he will I give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and pr prove you herewith. So he doesn't just give us everything all at once. Okay. Imagine that you're in the times of Joseph Smith. Probably the more important things are uh, like the Book of Mormon, um, baptisms for the dead, temple ordinances, sealings, everything that happened in the Kirtland Temple that was restored, all the keys. Okay. And so not everything is going to be be revealed right away. We might get some concept of something, but things over time are revealed. Okay. So what I believe happened is that in the early days of the church, it seemed based on reading the scriptures or uh, whatever that many, well, I don't know if many, but there were those back then that believed that there was that there was a literal main group that was hidden to the world. Okay. But over time, what I've noticed and not, I don't have everything on here yet. There's still more to fill in, but as you can see, you know, we're back in 1875. This is Orson Pratt and he in, in explicit terms in the journal of discourses says that there's a group and they're probably up in the Northern polar region because there's deep valleys that would be, uh, conducive to growing crops and th that would shield them, I guess, from harsh, uh, a harsh climate. Um, okay. And there's other ones I just said, Joseph Fielding Smith, James E. Talmadge, I'll add those later. Okay. But over time, it seems what happens is that the understanding changes. Okay. Um, here we have Hiram Andrus. He's a scholar, so he's not you know, a general authority. I still put him down though, because maybe for all I know, maybe he's like talked to uh, general authorities about it. And so that's why he's so sure, so sure about it. Or it could be that he's just, you know, basing his belief off of his, his own understanding in the way that he reads the scriptures. 
Um, in the in the talk that I listened to, uh, this one right here, Zion and Israel, Olive Tree Parable, he says that there were like letters and things <clears throat> of Joseph Smith talking about the ten lost tribes. Uh, I have not been. I'm not doubting him. I just haven't been able to find those. I haven't been able to find anything about Joseph Smith talking about the ten lost tribes being a main group. Okay, so anyway, let's continue. And you're you're going to say, well, uh, in the scriptures it says that John, the Revelator, is among them. That's right. But does that mean that it has to be among an organized body, or could John the Revelator have been up here? in Europe, preparing the minds of the people. Who knows what John the Revelator has been doing? We've talked about the three Nephites and John the Revelator. We know that the three Nephites have had the ability to appear in dreams. Uh, that's in the Journal of Discourses. Orson Pratt talks about how there were Native Americans that had dreams of three men. Uh, they identified themselves and they told them to go find Joseph Smith. And they traveled hundreds of miles and found him and got baptized. So, I think a lot of what John the Revelator and the three Nephites are doing are probably kind of in the background. They could be in dreams. They could be inspiring movements. Uh, they could have helped with the Reformation because that was something that needed to happen to make our church possible. Otherwise, it would have been a lot more difficult. So um, anyway, that's my thoughts about that. Okay, so let's get to what I found today. I have four from LeGrand Richards. Uh, one from President Nelson, but this is back when he was Elder Nelson, back in 1997. And then one from D. Todd Christofferson. Okay. So I'm going to go, I'm actually going to go, let's go chronologically. Okay. We'll start in 1971 in the mountain of the Lord's house, Elder LeGrand Richards. And what does he say? Okay, he says, Isaiah saw the mountain of the Lord's house established in the top of the mountains in the latter days. Um, he named the latter days, and he named the latter days when they would say, quote, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. How literally has been fulfilled in my way of thinking in this very house of God of Jacob right here on this rock. So he's talking about the Salt Lake Temple because Utah, you know, it's up in the mountains. It's a very high, it's a high elevation. Um, this temple, more than any other building of which we have any record, has brought people from every land to hear of his ways and walk in his paths. Um, and I just want to point out, many would, when they're, when they're talking about uh, Zion in from Jerusalem. We, we know that this is in reference to New Jerusalem and Old Jerusalem and primarily talking about the millennium. But here's an example where as of right now, Salt Lake is the New Jerusalem where it's at least it's like it's the headquarters of the church. Does that make sense? LeGrand Richards is talking about Salt Lake City as though it's Zion. I do, I do believe that um, the actual city will be built, the center place will be built in Independence, Missouri, but just right now, uh, Salt Lake is is where the headquarters is. It's Zion. It's, it's currently the center place of the church. Continuing, how literally... Okay, I already read that. Uh, I could tell you... Uh, I could tell you many stories about the great sacrifices our early pioneers and converts have made when they would sell everything they had in this world and leave behind their loved ones and their friends and their occupations to come to a far away, far away land and learn a strange language. What brought them here? The house of the God of Jacob, that they might learn of his ways and walk in his paths. Jeremiah saw the day when it should no longer be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. Just con Now, I want to stop right there. This is a scripture that uh, the other school of thought uses as exclusively referring to the ten lost tribes when they come out of the north and there's and there's like a highway of ice and, and we're going to go over that in just a minute uh, because President Nelson has something interesting to say about that highway of ice and um, 
So basically, because it's going to be so miraculous and so spectacular, um, it's going to outdo what happened in Egypt. Uh, universally, universally, the people that belong to that school of thought, they always, always, always insert the words miraculous, spectacular, more incredible, okay? It does not say that in the scripture. Let me read the actual scripture. Therefore, behold, the days come when the Lord, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth which brought up which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. It doesn't say anything about it being more spectacular, more incredible. Okay, if you look at right now today in the church, are we like the Jews where we celebrate Passover in the same way that they do, where we have like the Passover Seder and we're talking about the Passover and how we were preserved by the Lord um, in Egypt? No, that's not what we're doing. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because we're in a new dispensation. And again, we're going to get to what President Nelson says about that. So ju just hang on. But so this is why I'm putting this, okay, because uh, uh, many feel that this is proof right here that the 10 lost tribes are going to come from a hidden location. That's not how it's being used in this talk at all. You know, let's continue. Just contemplate the statement for that statement for a few moments. Think how the Jews and the Christians all through these past centuries have praised the Lord for his great hand of deliverance under the hands of Moses when he led Israel out of captivity. And yet here comes Jeremiah with this word of the holy prophet telling us that in the latter days they shall no more remember that but how God has gathered scattered Israel, Israel from the lands whither he hath driven them. And Jeremiah saw the day when the Lord would do this very thing when he would call for many fishers and many hunters, uh, quote, and they shall hunt from them, hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks, end quote. Uh, where do you find those fishers and hunters uh, that we read about in the, in the great prophecy of Jeremiah? These are, are these, that, sorry, they are these 14,000 missionaries of this church and those who have preceded them from the time that the prophet Joseph Smith received the truth and sent the messengers out to share it with the world. Thus have they gone out fishing and hunting and gathering them from the hills and the mountains and the holes in the rocks. I think this is more literal than some of us think. And uh, that touches on th this scripture is one where people will say, well, right now we're doing the fishing. That's what the missionaries are doing. But when there's the 144,000 after the 10 lost tribes come from the North Pole, then a literal 12,000 will be chosen from every single tribe. And then they will be super missionaries. And that's when the hunting begins. Nope. No. 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 <laughs> He's saying it right here. That's not what that's talking about. The missionaries right now are the ones that are doing the hunting and the fishing. And we just read from um, both Joseph Fielding Smith and Wilford Woodruff. Wilford Woodruff said that the angels that wanted to start reaping the world and bringing the judgments upon the world in the book of Revelation, they were told, nope, wait, wait until there's the 144,000. Wait for that first and then you'll be released. Well, in, uh, along with the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple in 1893, President Woodruff said that they've been released. So it would appear that that time has already passed. Okay, it, it says it explicitly in the book of Revelation. There, there's people uh, in the book, in the, in, I, I've, I've done, I have another playlist. <laughs> I have a playlist about the 144,000. Let's see 144. Where is it? Okay. Check out this playlist too. Okay, so we got the 10 Lost Tribes playlist and then the 144,000 playlist where I talk about this. One person that said that in his patriarchal blessing he was called as one of the 144,000 was Zadok Judd. 
I did a video about that. Um, there's other scripture or there's other uh, in the D Journal of Discourses talk about that, about people already being selected as the 144,000. OK, and that had all taken place before 1893 because that's when the angels were loosed. All right. So coming back here, um, the 144,000, uh, according to what we've researched, that's already done. And it I don't think it was ever a literal number because of how Jews communicate with numbers. And that would apply to the book of Revelation. And uh, so anyway, he's referring to the missionaries and, and all that. Okay, so he's not using the Jeremiah 16 scripture in the sense that, well, no, this hasn't happened yet because the 10 lost tribes haven't come from their hidden location. He's not using it that way at all. But uh, let's continue. He has a talk that he gave in 1974, April General Conference, simply titled Prophecy. Uh, by the way, he's a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. I don't know if I already said that. And uh, if I can find the highlights right here. Okay, through Jeremiah, the Lord said, uh, there's that scripture about the hunters and fishers. And then he continues, that is what we have been doing. He saw the day when, quote, it shall no more, no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but, be, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. And as he said, quote, one of a city and two of a family, end quote. That's Jeremiah 3, 14. And then he continues, that accounts for many of you being at this great conference that is being held here today. So again, if you're someone that reads uh, the Jeremiah 16 scripture in the 10 lost tribe main body sense, that cannot be a true statement because they haven't come yet from the North Pole or from space. But according to Legrand Richards, it does apply. It does. And uh, it makes sense because, again, most of them are going to be here in Europe. Okay? We know that there's a lot of uh, Jews that are up here. But as far as the Ten Lost Tribes, uh, they're kind of like in these same locations. And um, anyway, uh, we, we know, for example, that, you know, Sister Nelson talked about how there's all these different tribes that she came across in Russia. Okay, she came across all the tribes except for one in Russia, and then when the next day when they went down to Armenia, they came across, across a Levite. Um, and so within 24 hours, she had met at least one person from all 12 tribes, or you could say 13 if you're including if you're including Levi, because there would be 13 groups. Um, and then I had a subscriber comment that she's from Russia and she said that it's common over there to be from different tribes. So this seems to be happening right now. And just think about how that was inaccessible before the fall of the Soviet Union. Once that happened, you know, th this could be mostly where they've been in Russia, in Ukraine, and these uh, Soviet or, or uh, ex-Soviet countries. Um, but also, I would think in the West, too, <clears throat> especially the UK and whatever. So, all right, so let's go back. So, Jeremiah 16, 14 through 15, that accounts for many of you at this great conference that is being held here today. Okay, now, 1975. Uh, it's him again. Prophets and Prophecy is the name of the talk. And he says, just to illustrate the fulfillment of that, when President McKay went to Scotland to help organize the first stake in his Bonnie Scotland, on his return in reporting to us, uh, Brethren of the Twelve in the Temple, he said he left London at two o'clock in the afternoon, and he spent a little time with the Brethren in Chicago. And he was in his own bed that night. Uh, he didn't have to. He didn't have time to loosen the shoe latchets of his shoe or to slumber or sleep. Then he compared that with when his people came to Zion in the early days, uh, when they were 43 days on the water, 
and then weeks getting across the plains. Just think of that gathering. I wish there were time to go further into the prophecies of how our people were um, were to be brought here and travel along the riverbanks and so forth. And this our pioneers did, and that the Lord would turn their sorrows into rejoicing. Then Jeremiah said, the day would come uh, that it would that it shall no more be said the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. He's using it again. He's using it again. Continuing, then Jeremiah adds that the Lord would send many fishers and they would fish them, and many hunters, and they would hunt for them in the hills, from the mountains, and from the holes in the rocks. Any of you who have been out in the mission field in scattered areas will know how our missionaries, over 21,000 of them, are going from door to door, in hamlet to hamlet, gathering the people, as the prophet said, out of the holes of the rocks and the hills. You will realize how literally this church is fulfilling the words of the prophets. So again, he's talking about Jeremiah 16 in the sense of the pioneers. The pioneers and <clears throat> the, the immigration that took place and the trek, the pioneer trek. You know, it's really popular and it's a big thing throughout the church to do pioneer treks for the youth. It's a way that we commemorate what happened, right? And uh, that's what we're acting out. Is anybody... Are there any um, youth conferences or whatever where they do like a reenactment of the Red Sea and, and Moses? No, they do the pioneer trick. And it's not because this is more marvelous or spectacular or, you know, paranormal. It's because that was for that time, from the time of Moses to the time of Christ and even probably after that, up until the pine, until the last dispensation where we're having this final gathering. And it started out in a pretty brutal way. People lost their lives. They had to, there was a lot of sacrifice and there were a lot of miracles too. If you're looking for miracles, there were miracles that took place in those days. All right, so now let's move on to the next one. This is now 1981, LeGrand Richards, be ye prepared. What does he say here? You remember the words of the prophet Jeremiah. He said the, the day would come when it should no longer be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the, all the lands, uh, whither he hath driven them. And he would send for many fishers and they would fish them and for many hunters and they would hunt them from the hills and from the mountains and from the holes in the rocks. That's the 30,000 missionaries scattered throughout the world gathering in Israel. Okay. Um, let's see. Now let's move on to D. Todd Christofferson preparing for the Lord's return. This was just a few years ago, 2019. He says, let's see, Jeremiah's prophecy is being fulfilled. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Okay, I'm not going to read that again. Um, that's basically it. He's saying that this is being fulfilled. This, can, this scripture cannot be fulfilled in the other school of thought until the ten lost tribes come out of the north. It can't. This is a this statement doesn't make any sense in that context. But D. Todd Christofferson says Jeremiah's prophecy is being fulfilled. Okay, let's see. Now let's go to President Nelson. Again, this is this was originally given in 1997. It's called the Exodus Repeated. All right. This was given at BYU, but then it was published in the end sign. Many instructive parallels exist between the exodus from Egypt of the Israelites under Moses and the exodus from the United States of the Latter-day Saint pioneers under Brigham Young. 
Okay, so we, this whole talk is about this parallel. Think about this scripture. It'll no longer be said, you know, the Lord about the Lord bringing Israel out of Egypt, but then it's going to change to the Lord bringing the house of Israel out of the north country and out of the countries where I've driven them. Okay, so this parallel, verses 7 and 8, he's using this, and I'll show you where. He's using this and comparing it to Moses and Brigham Young, uh, the ancient Israelites, and the modern-day pioneers. I'm not going to read the whole article. I just kind of highlighted a few, or talk, I mean, I just highlighted a few of the things here. Generally, historical sketches and pageants have portrayed well what the pioneers did, but only a few writers have delved deeply enough to explain why. Even fewer have reported the similarities between the pioneer trek and the exodus from Egypt. An obvious likeness is that both groups have their inland sea of salt water, meaning the Dead Sea and the Great Salt Lake, and a Jordan River. But there were many other very significant similarities. Ancient Israel and modern Israel are linked arm in arm. The Josephs. Ancient Israel had leaders before Moses, and modern Israel had a prophet president before Brigham Young. The, prede the predecessors for each group also bore a resemblance to each other. A name common to both was Joseph. Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, and the prophet Joseph Smith. All right, skipping down. Moses and Brigham Young. Moses and Brigham Young had much in common. They were astute followers uh, before they became great leaders. Moses had been prepared in the courts of Egypt and had gained much experience in military and other responsibilities. Brigham Young was likewise prepared for his leadership role in the march of Zion's camp, uh, which was basically a military operation. He, came, he had observed the leadership of the prophet Joseph Smith under difficult conditions. Brigham Young aided in the removal of the prophet Joseph Smith from Kirtland. He also directed the move of the persecuted saints from Missouri to Nauvoo. We lament that leaders of both groups had to endure dissensions uh, from their close associates. On occasion, Moses encountered opposition from his beloved Aaron and Miriam. Uh, Latter-day leaders also suffered contention among their trusted associates. The journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai took about three months. The journey from Winter Quarters to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake also took about three months. The destination for each group was described by the Lord as a land flowing with milk and honey. The pioneers turned their wilderness into a fruitful field and made the desert blossom as a rose, precisely as prophesied by Isaiah centuries before. Okay, so that's pretty astounding. You know, th this is a pretty clear parallel. Okay, again, when we're reading Jeremiah verses 7 and 8 in chapter 23, um, you have to think about this. These are two groups being led from somewhere to somewhere new and that are and that are afterwards commemorated. Okay. Miracles shared. Both groups shared many miracles. Okay, so if, if you insist that there it has to be miraculous, it has to be more miraculous, um, which it doesn't. That's not what this scripture says, but there's miracles. Both groups shared many miracles that are memorialized annually. The celebration of Passover relates to the travels of the ancient Israelites, and each July we repeat legendary stories of our pioneers. Both groups traversed deserts, mountains, and valleys of untamed wilderness. Ancient Israelites left via the parted waters of the Red Sea as dry land. <clears throat> the pioneers left the United States, crossing the wide waters of the Mississippi River, frozen to become a highway of ice frozen to become a highway of ice. Well, why would that be significant that President Nelson is talking about these two groups that are parallel groups that took the same amount of time to get to Mount Sinai, into um, the Salt Lake Valley, and now he's talking about <clears throat> a highway of ice. Well, where does that come from? When you read Doctrine and Covenants 133, it says, verses 26 and 27, And they who are in the north country shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice and shall no longer stay themselves. 
And they shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall flow down at their presence, and an highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep. Okay? President Nelson is essentially saying that that's what this is referring to. Okay, I, I know it's really fun to think about just like a, a big old ice bridge coming from the North Pole and then leading to, I don't know, New York City or Canada or something like that. Um, sorry, and then there's so much to this because you're going to be like, well, what about the prophets? You know, lead you guys. We've had prophets because since we are from the north, like mo a lot of us are from, have European ancestry, that's us. And we've had prophets, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor. And then on top of that, back before they became lost to themselves and to the world, uh, certainly they wrote scripture. And on the tracker, we have Dallin H. Oaks who talked about how the... Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls is one way that new scriptures could come forth in the future because we know that they will. So it doesn't sound like Down H. Oaks is expecting living prophets to come from a main group to, to deliver scriptures, but that they'll have been in the earth for a long time or in other locations. So you had prophets back then before they lost who they were, and you've had prophets among them now once the this dispensation got going. Okay, so anyway, he says, the Mississippi River frozen to become a highway of ice. The book of Exodus reports that quail were miraculously provided to feed the hungry people of ancient Israel. The pioneers had an equivalent experience. After the last of them had been driven out of Nauvoo, many were sick and some died. Their provisions were meager. On the river bottoms near Montrose, Iowa, on the 9th of October, 1846, many quail miraculously flew into the camp. The quail were cooked and fed to some 640 destitute people. Of all animals, okay, it, it's really clear that the Lord is intentionally comparing these two groups, okay? And then President Nelson says, it was also miraculous that a permanent settlement survived in the valley of the Great Salt Lake. Seagulls that saved the crops were part of that miracle. We all know the, the crickets and the seagulls story, the, you know, the locusts. Um, <clears throat> God preserved ancient Israel from plagues sent upon Egypt. Similarly, God preserved the saints from the plague of the United States Civil War, which caused more American deaths than any other war. If you're not familiar with U.S. geography, <clears throat> at that time, the, the Utah was outside of the United States. The civil, it kind of like ended like around here. You know, I don't I don't think Kansas was a state yet. Uh, it was going to be pretty soon, but um, most of the action was taking place here in the eastern states. So a really bloody war was taking place right here. And the saints were over here safe, away from that. Okay. Let's see. The children of Israel had a portable tabernacle wherein covenants were made and ordinances were performed to strengthen them on their journey. Many Latter-day Saints were endowed in the Navi Temple before their arduous uh, trek westward. And by the way, there were endowments taking place in other places too, including on Enzyme Peak. People received their endowments up on Enzyme Peak. Uh, that's north of uh, downtown Salt Lake. Um, there was also the endowment house. So, okay, the Israelites gratefully celebrated their exodus from Egypt, and they still do today. The Jews still do that. Uh, the Latter-day Saints commemorated their exodus with the establishment of the world headquarters of the church in the tops of the mountains. All celebrants acclaim their deliverance by God. Uh, from the time of Moses to the resurrection of the Lord, the Sabbath also commemorated the liberation of the Israelites from their bondage, bondage in Egypt. In the latter days, saints keep the Sabbath day holy in memory of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Okay. And that's all the highlighted parts. But um, he, uh, 
he referenced, I think I skipped over it. Yeah, right here. Let's see. He he references the exodus from Egypt and the establishment of modern day church headquarters. He references it with this Jeremiah 23, verses 7 through 8. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but with the modern day pioneers and the establishment of Salt Lake City and the church headquarters, the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the pioneers, or the seed of the house of Israel, out from the north country, Europe, and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. All right. So, you guys, it just, you know, I know it's really fun. It's really fun to speculate all these like different sci-fi solutions as to where the 10 lost tribes could be or what it would be like having a people that have been completely separated from, you know, the rest of the world. Um, have they have they advanced in technology? Is that what their rich treasures are going to be? Um, which I don't think that's the case. It's going to be those scriptures that we eventually discover. Um you know, or are they going to be like, just, are they going to look completely different from us? Are they, um, you know, have they preserved Hebrew better than modern day Hebrew? You know, stuff like that. I, I So, look, this tracker is not done. Uh, I'm aware of a number of different things that still need to go on there. Uh, just a, a sneak peek. We got Bruce R. McConkey and his son, uh, what is it, Joseph? F. McConkie, I think, uh, that were in favor of not a main group. We have James E. Talmadge and um, Joseph Fielding Smith that seem to be, well, James E. Talmadge was explicitly in favor of it. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, not so much, but he leaned more toward it, I think, from what I remember. So I'm going to go over all these things. We're just going to keep adding to this spreadsheet. And I, I don't really expect the trend to change again the trend seems to be early days of the church all the way up until maybe the early or the first half maybe of the 20th century uh a leaning toward there being a, a lost civilization of 10 lost tribes but then after that there's a pretty marked change uh in attitude you know uh, we also have brad wilcox that just this year talked about it and he explicitly said that uh, they're not a main group so i'll do i've already done a video of that by the way so just go to my playlist i've already you can it's right here brad wilcox on the 10 lost tribes at the ice caps i've done a couple videos about that fireside by the way so uh this is gonna fill up don't worry i'm aware um and don't be afraid to send me stuff, but just don't be offended if I don't get to it right away. But feel free to send me whatever you have. Uh, we'll put the uh, Eliza R. Snow uh, hymn on here as well. But that's going to be all the way back here in the 1800s, I think. Um, yeah, so we'll fill this up. All right, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it. And I'll talk to you guys later.